Hi everybody, I think uh, most of the participants this time are the same as uh, uh, last time and we have uh, one new participant this time, Robert. Um, his mic doesn't seem to be working so he will uh, most probably uh, type in his question and I will read it out loud for everybody's uh, uh, convenience and then we will go ahead with the answers. But uh, just like last time, uh, we will have a, a two questions from uh, our Brazilian friends and then we'll go over to Robert and then back to uh, Brazilian friends. So, uh, do you want to uh, ask your uh, next question, please? Uh, yeah, can you hear me clearly? Hello. Um, uh, reasonably, and if you can go a little bit closer to the mic, it would be uh, much more nicer. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. And can an everybody else mute while uh, the question is being asked, just for the purpose of clarity? Thank you. Well, considering that we still don't have a general view of this whole new physics, how can we interpret the results of the experiments and decide which ones we should consider relevant if they might not be predicted in current theories? Okay, so this question is about uh, given so many, uh, uh, given that we have like different experiments, how do we consider one result to be more relevant than the other uh, and uh, how do we go about deciding the significance of those results, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, um, David, do you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's, I think it's very noisy in Mirko's control room. I don't know if he that's, has Marina. Yeah, Marina, I guess. Yeah, that's much better. So, um, firstly, it's kind of similar to one of the questions that was asked before. Uh, when we measure things with the experiments, uh, measure the outcomes of the collisions, we compare with our partners on the other side of the ring to see if they see the same sort of thing. So that gives us a, a good idea of whether what we're seeing is real or whether it's just a, a statistical fluctuation or an artifact of some particular design of our detector. So once we know things are real, we then try to match what we see with a particular theory or one or more theories. So for example, if we see a a bump in a distribution of uh, what we call the invariant mass of two photons. What it could be due to is the creation of a Higgs particle. And if Atlas see the, the bump in the same place, of course they'll see it a bit later than us, but if they see it in the same place we can be pretty sure that uh, it's something that matches a known theory and if the height of that bump and with the background of that bump are all consistent with the theory or not. So th this is the first sort of thing we do. Now it could be that we see a bump in a place in mass, if you like, that we didn't expect and doesn't match any particular theory. Or we might see a bump uh, in a place that we do expect but much higher, maybe ten times higher than we, than we thought. And then we really have to go back and uh, talk to our theorist friends and try and figure out what this might actually be due to. Because a, a large part of what we do that makes life really interesting is that we don't know exactly what we're going to find. So the results of the experiment kind of drive back to the theory and the theory then comes back to us. So there's this circular process. Maybe Steve could add some things to this. Maybe Steve can also add what happens if one of the experiments sees something and the other one doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if CMS is unable to, to verify uh, our discovery, we just have to be patient and wait until they're able to do so. <laughs> I'm sorry, that conversation comes into play. Um, I, well, I should say that, you know, there's a, a step before we look at each other's results, uh, several steps beforehand, which are rather important and which tell us when a result is what we call significant. And this has to do with statistics. So we have um, what we call a, a background. That's basically a haystack, a whole lot of hay. And we're looking for a needle inside that. We're looking for a signal inside that. Uh, now, when you do that, you often have things that, that you know to expect, things you've already measured. 
uh, one model which has survived the past 40 years or so of our research is something we call now the standard model because it has validated itself so many times. Our yeah. measurements have been come more and more and more precise uh, in many different uh, ways of looking at that model. But that model has just survived the test of time. In fact, that model was so accurate that at uh, around 2000, when our preceding accelerator uh, LEP shut down, we were able to, to call up our friends in, in Chicago at, at a laboratory called Fermilab where they were turning on a powerful accelerator called the Tevatron and tell them that they were going to find a particle, that that particle they were going to find is the top quark. We knew all of its properties, its charge, and, and we could even tell them about what its mass was going to be. And, and that's an amazing feat of mankind when we can come up with a model based on measurements in the past and be able to make a prediction into the future. That's really an, an incredible thing. When we look back at it, history will look back at that and say that was a very important uh, step in the process of understanding nature. Now this model uh, has a lot of predictions it makes and you can have a distribution like Dave mentioned that's, that's a plot of mass. You get one of those by looking at lots and lots of events, uh, looking at the output of those events, and then reconstructing and saying what would have been the mass of a particle that gave birth to those other particles. You make that hypothesis that they came from something, and you plot that. We know what the background should look like, and that's just a simple, smooth distribution. Uh, with time, however, you see fluctuations, that's statistics. And we know from studying statistics how much that should fluctuate, how much it should be just a smooth line, and how much there should be bumps because we don't have enough data for it to yet be s smooth. If you understand your statistics well, and you understand what we call systematics, the, the potential errors that your detector, because it's not perfect, can introduce, you can make a what we call a significance. We can say that the bump that you see, this little anomaly, uh, is significant to a certain number of errors, one or two or three. And you've probably heard people say that we wait until there's five sigma to declare that there's a discovery. That's because we're five times the amount of error. And that means that we know it, that there's a one in a million chance uh, that that's not, you know, that it's a statistical fluctuation. So that's how we tell. We, we measure by this significance, and that's a real mathematical way to, to say whether you believe something or not. Thank you very much from, uh, uh, from, from both of you. Uh, then maybe we can move on to the next question from Robert here. Um, I will just read the question out, and then we will go back to our Brazilian friends after this question. So. Okay, so the next question from Robert is because he doesn't have a microphone, I'm going to read it uh, for you. I hope this isn't politically charged, but can you comment on Professor Heredato. Heredato resigning over the neutrino incident? We all knew this was surprising info and it was uh, well known from the start that there were controversial observations that uh, need more research. Why was there... Uh, a need for him to step down. Um, I think um, uh, maybe this question uh, um, um, is uh, is not in the spirit of uh, today's um, uh, today's uh, conversation. More about CMS and uh, uh, and um, uh, Atlas and uh, LHC in general. So I will now uh, go ahead and uh, move on to the next question from Brazil. Oops. Wait, you're, you're talking, wait, Mirko, are Mirko, you talking? You're, yeah, you're, you're muted, muted, Mirko. Sorry, my, I was still on mute. If I may comment, nevertheless, since the neutrinos, which, uh, which, uh, which were measured in, uh, which are measured constantly in Italy, were sent from the, from the control room, uh, we've been always waiting for a confirmation or, a, or, a, or, a, or the opposite of these, uh, of these results. I want to just underline that here at CERN, we only provide the neutrinos to the experiment that actually uh, and the collaboration that actually did uh, uh, the announcement uh, last year. So we have been not taking part uh, 
in in uh, in this uh, last year, in this discussion last year, we were just waiting for a confirmation of the results. That is just uh, for uh, maybe clarifying or uh, okay. uh, not leaving this question uh, unanswered. I, I don't mind making one small comment. I think I can do it without being political because um, because I'll try. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to make a call on something like this. Uh, our experiment, for example, has hundreds of thousands of cables in it, making it extremely, extremely complex. However, uh, okay, what's important, an important decision that has to be made sometimes is when we see something which differs from what we expect, uh, we check, and we check it with everybody, everybody in our, in our experiments, and we check between experiments. Uh, to see whether or not we have something. And if we cannot figure out any reason for it, uh, for this thing which is different than what we expect, it is our responsibility uh, to come forward and say, we see something, we don't understand it. Now, I don't know the details of what happened within this experiment at all, and I don't want to comment on any reason for someone to step down or not. Um, but I, ha I have to say that, that uh, you know, science, uh, in, this, in this case, what we know is, is what we publish has to be believable. Uh, people build bridges based on physics, on our results. We put out results. They have to be solid. Everybody has to be able to believe them. I believe any paper I read from my colleagues at CMS, I know that they've worked it out in detail. And we do the same thing in, in Atlas, I like to think. Uh, and so the public should be uh, beware and they should know that when we're putting something out uh, and publishing something that it's been tested and, and we believe it. Right, and, and in the same spirit, like we have two experiments here so that we can cross-check each other too, right? I mean, that's the whole, whole idea. Okay, now moving on to the question uh, from Brazil. Hello, my name is Renato. Can you read me? You have to really speak louder. Um, again, a little bit louder and closer to the microphone, please. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Uh, yes. My question is, my question is uh, what new priority will be established in CERN if the Riggs boson existence or no existence is confirmed? Well, uh, what new project would be established at CERN if the Higgs boson's existence or non-existence is confirmed? Is that the question? Yes, priorities. Okay. But new priorities. New priorities. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can start the question with uh, with Marco. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been I've been hearing uh, during uh, during these weeks, uh, months about new projects uh, that could be, or let's say, that could be see, seen light uh, in case we discover the exposon is where actually we saw some evidence of them. Um, I don't know, honestly. Uh, I know what is the future of the LHC for the coming years. I, uh, still, we have a lot uh, to investigate. We still have a lot of margin for a, for a, um, for a, for a, for a lot of margin of discovery. Um, I remind you that we are actually working at almost half of the nominal energy of this machine. So we have still a wide range in front of us for a either kind of discoveries, not only the X boson, but supersymmetry, dark matter, and whatever. So certainly the LLC was built and is now uh, being, uh, um, let's say, um, it's in the project of CERN to keep working with the LLC until at least uh, 2030. Uh, what comes, what will come later, either a, a lab free or whatever, there are many, many bizarre ideas coming uh, popping out, uh, out now. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, my personal opinion on the subject, if we discover uh, well, if we discover it's there, maybe, of course, it, the history will be closed for the for these. Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. What if we discover that it is not there? For me, this could open even a more, more interesting uh, new scenario in, uh, in, the, in the modern physics. We'll have to rewrite eventually all, all our uh, physics, uh, all, all our books of uh, modern physics. That could be even more, in, uh, more interesting. And certainly, um, the, the doubling the energy of the LHC could eventually uh, give an answer, a definite answer, in, uh, to the to this uh, question. I don't right, know what David. David see. Yep. So CMS control room, David, uh, do you want to add uh, what would you want to do at yeah. CMS based on what would you change at CMS? 
Well, we, we wouldn't change very much, actually. I mean, one of the things to point out is that on CMS there are currently more than 2,000 physicists working on analyzing the data that come out. And of those, there's a fraction of them that are actively looking for the Higgs boson uh, in different ways that the, the Higgs boson might manifest itself. So there are a couple of hundred, which is probably more than any other group within CMS. So they're, they're really focused on Higgs, that's sure. But there are many other groups who are actively looking for things like supersymmetry, uh, looking for standard model physics to understand things a bit more, uh, of the current things we already understand a bit, uh, and s groups looking for the unknown, what we call exotic physics. So this is all going on in parallel. It's not that the Higgs is taking over all of what we do in CMS and Atlas. It, it's just part of it. So clearly once the Higgs is understood, whether it's there or not, then some things will change. So some people will move to other parts, uh, but some people will stay on the Higgs and study and try and study in detail characteristics of the Higgs, produce more of them, or we, the LHC will produce more of them, we'll detect more, or try and understand a bit more. So it doesn't change drastically, it's not a very sharp cut-off. Yeah. Right. Well, if I can eventually uh, make a small uh, compliment, well, as you saw, so we took a lot of data last year, so we really tried to make the case to find something, to find the Higgs and so on, and we obviously did not, we don't yet have any proof that it exists, but it's quite, uh, I think you can imagine that if a bunch of uh, scientists, so 3,000 here in Atlas, more than 2,000 in CMS are searching for this thing and never found and did not find yet, it means that this is a very hair thing that, uh, that, that appears. So obviously as soon as you find it, if we find this here, uh, so if we find, we will probably want to, to study its properties, which me basically means that we are going to have to take a lot of data, more, much more data to study all the different uh, properties that a Higgs particle can have. Uh, we want to understand, for example, how it uh, interacts with other particles, how it talks to the other particles and so on. Uh, if it doesn't exist, then uh, there is a kind of a challenge, because then we are going to have to say, uh, okay, what makes the job of the Higgs? We have to find uh, this other thing. It must be foundable in some sense as well. And of course, uh, again, it's a lot of more data, more statistics, as uh, Steve was explaining before. So we need to accumulate a lot of statistics. So one of the things that uh, eventually uh, is starting to come in, into to people, people's minds, and in particular, I'm trying to push uh, our Brazilian groups <laughs> to help as well, is uh, to see if we can work. Uh, uh, we are going to need much more statistics, which means that we're going to need LHC to produce much more events, which comes to the, to the, to the need that eventually the amount of events that the LHC is going to produce is going to be much higher. This is what we call an upgrade scenario for the LHC. And this will come not only for, uh, if LHC changes in that direction, Atlas will have to change, CMS probably as well. So there are part of the detect, parts of the de these detectors, I suppose, that uh, in both cases, I know for Atlas, that are going to have to be changed. And this, of course, is a lot of more hard work that's going to be uh, needed. So we need more people more technology and, and much more developments. So, and more young right. people okay. to participate. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of new and exciting things that we still have to do. So now, can we go on to the next question from Brazil? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Are there other models, I mean alternative models of detectors being proposed or tested this time? Um, I, uh, so your question is about the detectors? Yeah, if there are other models being tested. Other models of detectors being uh, tested. Um, so do you mean? Uh, do you mean to say? Do you I mean uh, other technology than the detectors that we have here at CMS and Atlas and LHC in, in general, or are uh, are you interested in uh, the theoretical aspects? Sorry, they said the question is about particles. If there are other models of particles 
Okay, so it's a, okay. Other model, other theoretical models of particles. Yes, that's a very interesting question and a very broad question too. Uh, so let's start with um, Atlas this time, and then sure. go to CMS. <laughs> sure. Uh, there are as many models of particles uh, as there are theorists, probably uh, plus <laughs> one at least. Um, the, you know what we are calling the standard model uh, encompasses uh, electro electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force. Uh, we're still looking for something that will include gravity as well, for example, and that would be called a, a grand unified theory, something that can include all of it. Uh, and uh, supersymmetry you hear spoken about, and that, that's another model. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, we accept uh, uh, any model coming from a theorist provided uh, they can, in a mathematically consistent way, uh, explain measurements we've already made and give us a prediction which we can measure. Uh, then, then we pay attention to it and we, we look at those models and uh, they propose them. We have conferences, for example, uh, just this past month, uh, there's a, there's a uh, conference series called Morion, even though it isn't held in Morion, it was held in La Tuile in the Alps, uh, and that's where theorists and experimentalists got together and, and discussed various models and how they can go about looking for them. Uh, so this, there, there are a lot of models. Um, you can imagine it's, it's, it's a, a very difficult job because we see things uh, in nature which, which are very strange. Uh, the difference in the forces uh, of nature are incredible. Uh, the difference between the weakest of all forces and the, and the strongest of all forces. So, so gravity is extremely weak. Uh, you know, if you take a magnet and you go next to, your, to a toaster and you let go of it, the toaster wins over the entire planet, right? So there's a huge difference. That difference is something like a, 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 a one with 30 zeros after it. So to make a model that encompasses everything, which is something we like to do, it means there's symmetry in the world, uh, is, is very, very hard, but a lot of theorists spend a lot of time doing that. Dave, do you want to comment? I, I don't really have much to add. I think Steve gave a, a very comprehensive answer to that. I think that's fine. I don't have anything to add. Does that answer your question? Fantastic. I guess it did. Right, yep. <laughs> so I think I will ask the next question. Um, this question was actually posted on the Google Plus page. Um, so here is the question. Um, the question is, combined Higgs significance is rumored to be 4.3 sigma. Is this a combination of CMS plus Atlas or of channels, uh, uh, in, of all the Higgs channels in, uh, in one of the detectors? So maybe David can start with this uh, question. There are many rumors around, um, and this really qualifies as a rumor more than anything else. There has not been a proper combination of results from Atlas and CMS with the full data samples of last year, and there will not be one for some time to come. So people have sort of made some guesstimates, you know, they look at the, the results from Atlas and CMS and make their own combination of those uh, just by looking at a few plots and have come out with some numbers around the four mark of the significance, um, but really don't believe the hype yet. Uh, I think there's still a long way to go uh, inside the experiment, or certainly inside CMS, it's more around the two mark. Now, it, we're constantly refining our analysis of the data from last year. So some weeks, in fact, it goes up to 2.3 or 2.4, and other weeks it goes down to 2.1, 2.2. Uh, but this is to be expected as we understand more about the data that we're looking at. But uh, we're, we're nowhere near 3 or 4 yet. We'll wait until the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe I, I just add a comment. Uh, how, for those of you who know some statistics, uh, some of these sort of rumors come about uh, by not quite knowing enough. 
and uh, when you see a statistical signal of a certain amount, of, a, of an error of a certain amount, say like two, and you're tempted to take the square root of two squared plus two squared <laughs> and say, oh, that's the error on the overall signal. And those are the sort of simplistic things that people do. The reality is much, much more complicated to combine results. Uh, and I think the qu there was a question asked about combination within the experiment of the different channels as well as combining the two experiments. Uh, that we have both done and there are papers that were published uh, in January, very good papers from both experiments uh, combining and, and that's what gives rise to these only few sigma signals uh, that, were, that we talk about. Right. Fantastic. Thanks for the answers and um, Maybe we yeah, can from, our, more. Mm -hmm. from our side, uh, I, I hope David was answer, answering positively to the question because that would have raised a lot of pressure or it has been put on us to get a 15% to bound this year. <laughs> well, y as long as you start today. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so go, um, going on to Brazil, again one more question. Hi, I am Carol, and my question is, why higher energies are needed? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I missed it. Yeah. Why higher energies are needed? What higher energies are needed? Maybe Marco can start answering this question. I, I think this was more a question for the for the for the experiment, the less on my on my side. Uh, let's say a simplistic answer could be if you want to go closer and closer to the to the Big Bang, uh, we have to increase the energy of the particles of meshing in the, into 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 the experiments because we want to uh, to go closer and closer to the to the eastern zero of the universe where there was a lot of mass with a lot of energy concentrated in the same point. This is uh, I think this is what you meant with the with your question, isn't it? From I I guess I did, so, yeah. I mm -hmm. yeah um, I I better the, the, the well, leaving Dave and, uh, and, and Steve answering, they will they will centrally answer answer better from uh, from the from the experiment's point of view. Okay. Well, I, I I think there's the two two points which uh, why the high energy is is necessary. So one clear point is that if you don't have energy high enough, then you might not simply build the, the, the particles. So for example, if you have an energy which is uh, 80 GV, for example, of the beam, uh, and your Higgs is 120, whatever it is, uh, of course you're not going to produce Higgs. It's going to be very unlikely that you're going to find any Higgs. So if we start to talk about these uh, supersymmetric particles which have a TV uh, uh, energy scale uh, of the order of TV, then you need a few TV more in order in the collision in order to produce and not only that uh, as, 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 as higher the higher the energy uh, you can better uh, try to separate it's easier it makes life easier to simply uh, to extract from the, the background from this smooth background uh, the things which we really care about so it makes it more visible at the end uh, it's a bit like uh, you you try to well it's a bit like you try to, to see things that with a very high resolution. So you start by looking with a microscope, which is basically putting photons at very low energy. And then afterwards you say, okay, but I want to see something which is even smaller than that. So I need an um, uh, electronic microscope, which is going to f shoot uh, electrons at high energy. So then you start to have definition at uh, even smaller things. So when you want to really make a even smaller things, and when you want to start to look at inside the nuclei, uh, inside of a proton, for example, then you need much higher energy at the end. So there's this, there are these uh, two folds uh, on, on the question. So one side is with a high energy, you build things, and uh, with high energy, you also make things more visible, if you want. Okay. David, do you want to add something more to it? Well, I, again, I, I don't think I need to add anything more. No. And if okay. that answers your question, yep. uh, the lady in Brazil can say if that answers it or not. I think it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If 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 I make a comment, nevertheless, to the to the to the last uh, thing, it, it is sure. Uh, well, you if you want to investigate a, pr a very precise phenomenon, 
you you it could be sufficient to have a, a, even a lower energy. It is the case, for example, for the for the laptop machine. They go with a very reduced uh, mm, uh, range of energies, and uh, they can investigate specific phenomena. Specific phenomena. If you use another machine and you want to investigate a wide range of possibilities, a wide range of events, the higher the energy, the better the better it is. Just uh, right. Thank you. So the next question again was uh, posted on our Google Plus page. So I will ask the question. So the question is. Will Higgs boson discovery be a Eureka moment in the control room or a quiet moment in the distributed data analysis center? Uh, I, 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 I don't know who wants to go first. David, do you want to go I, first? I, did, I, did, I, didn't, I, didn't get the, I didn't get the question. If you can repeat. OK, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is, will Higgs boson discovery be a Eureka moment in the control room or a quiet moment in the distributed uh, data analysis uh, centers? Yeah, maybe I can. Oh, maybe I can comment on that. Um, neither. It, it, I mean, the, the control room really that I'm in at the moment, and that Steve and his colleague are in in Atlas, and in fact the, the control room that Mirko is in, they're really dealing with the the day-to-day -day operations. So making sure that the detector is doing what it should be doing, in our case. Uh, and that everything is understood and that the data coming out of that of the detector are understandable and real and uh, and make sense and they're all there so we don't really do the analysis here it's just the first level making sure everything's okay uh, once the, the CMS is sure internally that we've discovered something uh, it will be a big moment. I don't know whether a eureka moment is the right word, but it will certainly be a, a turning point, and it will be a big deal uh, within the CMS, and a lot of people will be joined to the CMS internal meetings from all around the world, from our, our own collaboration, probably including people here in the control room. They'll be joined to the meeting to, to see that announcement. Then uh, the likelihood is that... Atlas will see similar thing or the same thing at the roughly the same time. They'll have their own internal meetings, and then there'll be a seminar at CERN to announce these findings to the world. So it's not a eureka moment; it's it's a, a jump for joy moment, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would I would say the same thing. Uh, it, it's it will be. In my opinion, I think it will be a little bit anticlimactic because we're going to see if there's a if it's a Higgs that we're talking about and the Higgs signal is growing, it's going to grow slowly. So we might see a significance increase to 2, 2.3, 2.5, <laughs> and we'll start to gain confidence that there's something there. But I don't think any of us, there won't be a point where we actually jump up and down until maybe the publication is made, <laughs> and uh, and then then we'll we'll rest happily. Okay, thank you. If, if, uh, I, if so I may, if I may add, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> I hope from mm -hmm. our side that it will be a eureka moment because people will come here to to congratulate without to for, to to provide such good beams and good collisions. <laughs> okay, well, fantastic. Well, if I also can make a quick comment, uh, well, the, the the great moment that we had here in the control room was actually when we first saw, so it was the moment where the LHC was exactly making a plot showing we are going to make the beams touch it and collide with each other, and immediately, you saw, uh, like uh, the next second we look, then we have an event display of the first event. So this was the moment where there was champagne and so on, so it was quite exciting. But it's true that if we find the Higgs and so on, it's going to be like what we had in, se in December the 13th last year, where we basically have a meeting with, uh, with the bosses of the collaborations, let's say, just to announce what are the numbers, what are the confidences that we have, and so on. Oh. Yes, I mean, that is true. The best time we had was when we saw the first collisions.